people and we can go ahead and get into the content. So thank you so much for taking the time to join our webinar. We're going to be talking about CPT code 99091 and how to obtain reimbursement for remote patient monitoring. Uh, before we get started, we want to make a disclaimer that the information that we're covering today is for educational and reference purposes only. Um, it does not uh, contain professional advice and doesn't necessarily reflect up-to-date information uh, or opinions of uh, CMS. So for providers interested in billing this code, we advise them to read the specific statutes in detail and seek any professional guidance that's needed. So just to introduce who's on the phone, uh, I'm Genevieve Lee Simon. I'm the Director of Customer Marketing here at Glucco. And with me is Marianne Fedorowitz. Marianne is a registered dietitian, an MBA, a CDE, and notably she's been a certified endocrinology coder for over 20 years. So she's very experienced in reimbursement, in coding, in working with CMS. And so we are very grateful to have her here today to talk to us about CPT 99091. A couple of housekeeping items. Uh, this webinar is being recorded. Um, <clears throat> the recording will be emailed tomorrow uh, so that you can reference it again at your leisure. <laughs> we do have a large audience on the phone today, so the lines are being muted just for ease of presentation. There is going to be a question and answer session at the end of the webinar, so if you do have a question that you'd like us to address, Please type in your questions in the questions box. We'll be monitoring those as the webinar uh, goes on, and we'll be taking the most frequently asked questions during the Q&A session. Uh, if for some reason uh, we aren't able to get to your question, we are going to be sending out a post-webinar survey after the webinar concludes, so please uh, uh, provide us with any additional questions that you might have, and we'll get back to you by email. So this is what we're going to cover today. We're going to give a brief overview of remote patient monitoring and what its benefits are. We'll talk a little bit about how to use Gluco for remote patient monitoring, how to build CMS for remote patient monitoring with 99091, how remote patient monitoring fits into Medicare's quality payment program, what the steps to implement Gluco are, and then we'll conclude with the questions and answers. So I'm going to turn it over to Marianne to give you an overview of remote patient monitoring. Good morning, everyone. This is Marianne Hodorowitz. I'm so pleased to be with you today, and I want to thank Gluco for their trust in me. It's been uh, just a huge pleasure to work with them. Um, just and, and Jenny, thank you. So let's get right into it. Remote patient monitoring, I'm going to be using the term RPM to refer to that. And so I'm starting here at the 12 o'clock mark on this graphic where the patient collects and stores what's called patient-generated health data. You'll see that now in the literature. They'll acronym it as PGHD. And then going to the right clockwise, the patient then transmits the data electronically to the provider in real time or near real time. And that transmission is done through a computer, a tablet, or a smartphone. Then moving down to the left, the provider accesses that data on his computer, in his office, his or her computer, and makes any necessary treatment plan changes required for that patient. And then moving up and to the left, the provider then communicates any changes in the treatment plan to the patient. And this communication can be by email, text, or phone call. So this truly is a remote patient monitoring intervention. So let's look now at the benefits of RPM. And when we were creating the slide deck, Jenny and I, I thought really long and hard about the benefits because I've been in the world of diabetes, oh gosh, for over 30 years. And I'm just so excited about this that Medicare is now paying for this kind of remote intervention. And so let's look at what RPM can do to make diabetes care um, higher quality. It makes diabetes care more accurate because treatment decisions are data driven and data is evidence-based. You, you know, I, my husband is a CPA 
And boy, I've heard for 37 years, one plus one always equals two, no matter how you manipulate the data. And that's why this is just such a wonderful benefit because it is hardcore data driven. It makes diabetes care more accessible because a face-to-face -face visit now is not required. This can all be done remotely. The patient can be at home, on a golf course, in a restaurant, and the, the provider can be in his or her own office. It makes the care more targeted because the provider now, when he's looking at the patient data on a computer, can focus on areas where the patient has the most opportunity for improvement, meaning is it fasting blood sugar, postprandial, uh, nocturnal, because the data is specific to those periods of time. And it makes the care more immediate. And this is a really key here. We get faster care to improve patient outcomes because again, the patient does not have to come to the provider's office for a face-to-face -face visit. It makes the care preventive. If the care is faster and more expedient, that means, and of course that means more frequent interactions, and that alone is gonna help prevent the serious complications of diabetes, in or, meaning we can prevent a lot of those complications with more expedient, faster, and quality care. It makes diabetes care more engaging. Patients are more connected with their providers because of this remote opportunity to be on the telephone, to be texting, to be emailing about changes in the care plan. And again, the patient does not have to come into the provider's office. And they're gonna be more engaged to actively manage their health through their smartphone, their computer, or their tablet. It's more, the care is more reliable because the data is automatically transmitted directly from the diabetes device into the smartphone, the tablet, or the computer. And the diabetes devices are blood glucose meters, insulin pumps, and CGM devices. And it makes the care more digital. This increases the provider's experience with digital data applications because this is the wave of the future. We're just at the threshold of digital data applications. And with this benefit now in Medicare, the provider can, at, at the way I would say it is dip their toe into digital data medical interventions uh, without a high learning curve. So thank you for being on this webinar to get through the learning curve. It makes the care more directly profitable. And that's because RPM is now payable by Medicare and billable with other services on the same day for the same patient. So like an evaluation and management visit, along with an RPM claim, they're both billable on the same day. It makes the diabetes care indirectly profitable because of the CMS new quality payment program. If you haven't heard of this, this is their new payment program that is dipping their toe into value-based care pay for performance type of reimbursement. So eligible clinicians in the QPP merit-based incentive payment system known as MIPS can earn bonus payment points for using remote patient monitoring. And it makes the care easier to bill because no Medicare telehealth audio, visual, and rule requirements are required for the remote patient monitoring benefit. Thank now you. we're gonna look at how to use Gluco for remote patient monitoring and I'm gonna turn it over to Jenny. Thanks, Marianne. So I'll give a quick overview of Gluco. So Gluco is a diabetes data platform. Uh, we like to call ourselves a universal diabetes data platform because we are compatible with over 95% of the meters uh, pumps, CGMs that are out there on the marketplace. So what we do is we can sync data from all those different devices. We're also compatible with uh, fitness trackers and other um, biometric trackers. So uh, Fitbit, um, uh, Apple Health, uh, Connected Scales. We can aggregate all of that data together and make it available to Gluco so that people with diabetes can better understand how their actions uh, impact their blood glucose levels. That information is also available to the provider. And so we enable the 
people with diabetes and the providers to better collaborate on the care. So who go meets uh, the CMS billing requirements for the systems that must be used for remote patient monitoring? The requirement specifically around the systems is that they must generate, uh, they must transmit patient generated health data to the provider in real time or near real time. So any tools that collect data but don't transmit that data to the provider is not eligible for reimbursement under 99091. And the way Glucose works is that the patient would download the Google mobile app onto their smartphone. They could sync their device data to Gluco anywhere they are. So, you know, at home, in the office, they can sync that data to the Gluco mobile app. And once they sync that data, that data is automatically available to the provider. And the next time the provider logs into the Gluco system, that patient's data will be there, and then they can review it and make any treatment changes that they <clears throat> deem are necessary. So we provide data in lots of different views to help patients and providers better identify opportunities where changes to the care plan might be needed. And so for example, this view here on the left shows you uh, glucose levels overlaid with carb, insulin, and exercise information for a patient. And when you look at this particular graph, you can see here on this day, the patient had a low event. Um, and when you look at what was happening that day, you know, uh, relative to the other days of the week, the patient was consuming relatively more carbs, taking more insulin, and um, has had a higher level of activity. And so perhaps there was something happening uh, on that particular day that drove that low, uh, but the provider can then use this information and then get some more information from the patient to understand more specifically what was happening that day and then discuss what could be modified as part of the treatment plan to help prevent that low from happening in the future. So this is just one way how we can help identify opportunities for care plan improvement. So how to use Gluco for RPM. So <clears throat> providers would ask patients to download the Gluco mobile app onto their phone and ask them to sync their meter pump or CGM data to Gluco at least once every 30 days. Once the patients do sync that data, the data is automatically available to the provider to review on demand. So next time the provider logs into the Gluco system, that data will be there, and then the provider can take the time to review the data, make any adjustments to the treatment plan, and then communicate those changes to the patient. Thank you, so Jenny. Back over to Marianne. Yeah, thank you, Jenny. So now we're going to talk about billing Medicare for RPM with procedure code 99091. So as we know, as of January 1, 2018, CMS, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, i.e. Medicare, now reimburses for RPM. So the actual definition, the statutory definition of the CPT code, this is a procedure code, is the collection and interpretation of physiologic data, meaning ECG, blood pressure, glucose monitoring, digitally stored and or transmitted by the patient and or the caregiver to the physician or other qualified healthcare professional requiring a minimum of 30 minutes of time. And for the calendar year 2018, Medicare has set a payment rate of $58.68 per patient per each 30 days. But that's when the 30 minutes of RPM time has been accrued. That's called the threshold amount of time. Now this rate is geographically unadjusted. And Medicare does a geographically adjust its payment rates for all the med medical interventions it pays for. And you can access your geographically adjusted rate on the CMS website, which is cms.gov. And you do not have to be an enrolled provider to access your rate. So let's look at some more of the billing requirements that Medicare has published, and these are statutory requirements. Code 99091 requires, this is billing the code, requires the use of a two-way active platform. 
And what does that mean, two-way? The patient or the beneficiary must be able to digitally collect, store, and, keyword and, transmit that patient-generated health data to the provider in real time or near real time. So that's the two-way platform, collect and store and transmit. And that second activity, the transmission, if the patient's using a passive platform or tool that collects the data in an app or on the computer, but the app or the software does not allow the transmission of the data to the provider, then that platform is ineligible for reimbursement and the provider cannot then bill 99091. Now, to initiate RPM services to an eligible patient or Medicare beneficiary, if it's a new patient or a patient who has not been seen by the provider within one year, must have a face-to-face -face visit to initiate the RPM services. So again, if, if the beneficiary, Martha, has not seen Dr. Miller for over one year, or she's new to Dr. Miller, she has to have a face-to-face -face visit with the provider. And the provider has to obtain written consent for the RPM services from the patient and document that written consent in the patient's record. Now, this is a threshold of time. So CPT code 99091 is what we call a time-based procedure code. And there's other time-based codes, as you're probably familiar with, like diabetes training and medical nutrition therapy. So for this code, the provider and the patient has to accrue a minimum of 30 minutes of RPM services during a 30-day period. And so your question right now is, what do those services or activities include that can go into that 30 minute threshold. It's educating the patient on how to use the RPM solution, retrieving and reviewing the patient data in the provider's office, the provider modifying the patient's care plan right in the office, and then the provider communicating by phone, text, or email with the patient about the data, and this really is what makes it remote, and then the provider documenting all of those remote patient monitoring activities in that patient's chart in the provider's office. And all the minutes that are being utilized to do these different activities go into that 30 minute threshold in a 30 day period for billing. Now we bill Medicare when the 30 minutes of time in that 30 day period has been accrued in providing all these different activities. Now the actual billing date, the date of billing, does not have to be on the 30th or the 31st of the calendar month. It's whenever the 30 minutes has been accrued. So time spent on multiple days by multiple practitioners can be combined to meet the 30 minute requirement, but only one provider can bill. But if the same RPM activity, such as educating the patient on the app, just educating the patient is furnished by two or more practitioners at the same time, only the minutes accrued by the one practitioner doing the education can be counted toward the 30 minute threshold. What's important to note is that general planning or general care coordination time does not count toward the 30 minutes unless it is specifically related to the RPM activity. So if a unit secretary um, or an MA is scheduling the patient for the first face-to-face -face visit, that does not count into the 30 minutes of time. To validate the number of minutes spent, the provider must document both the start and end time of each of these activities that are furnished. And that's true for all time-based codes. And what's nice about EHRs is that there is a time tracking tool within the EHR that makes it easier for the provider to document the start time and the end time for the education activity, the data review activity, communicating with the patient. The EMR um, software allows you to document that start and end time. So let's look at some more requirements. As typical Medicare, we have a lot of requirements, but that's okay. Interpreting the beneficiary's digital data in the medical record, 
that is not specifically from the beneficiary owned RPM digital tool is not to be included in that 30 minute threshold. So again, the data has to be coming from that RPM tool that allows that two-way active platform. Code 99091 is payable both in non-facilities and facilities. And when Medicare says facility, that always means hospital. And every other medical entity, like a clinic, a physician practice group, is considered non-facility. Code 99091 should be billed no more than once every 30 days. So that's the time period. It's a 30-day time period per beneficiary. As we mentioned before, Medicare's geographically unadjusted payment rate for calendar year 2018, when all of these requirements are met, is $58.68, and that's per beneficiary per a 30-day time period. So remember, it's a 30-minute threshold of time in a 30-day period, but this rate is geographically unadjusted. And you could look up your adjusted rates if you're in Detroit, Michigan, Joliet, Illinois, Chicago, Illinois, on cms.gov. And just note that every year, every calendar year, Medicare does adjust its payment rates for all of its paid interventions. Now, the multi-million dollar question here is who can bill and who can furnish remote patient monitoring services. Right now, at, with the rollout of this code, which was effective January 1, 2018, so it's only been a few months, who can furnish and who can bill? MDs and DOs, and then what Medicare calls qualified non-physician practitioners. And specifically, these individuals are nurse practitioners, clinical nurse specialists, physician assistants, and certified nurse midwives. Now they have to be enrolled in Medicare Part B, <clears throat> excuse me, or in the opt-out status. So if Dr. Miller, MD, is doing what we call concierge medicine, and he is not enrolled in Part B, and he is not officially enrolled in an opt-out status, he's in neither one of these statuses, then he cannot bill for remote patient monitoring. Now, the question we get asked all the time is can clinical staff, the clinical staff, say the RN or the diabetes educator working for Dr. Miller, can that clinical staff furnish RPM services and then allow Dr. Miller to bill? The answer is maybe. And why do I say that? Because in the actual definition of CPT code 99091, if you look at the orange font here, it says digitally stored and or transmitted to the physician orange font or other qualified healthcare professional qualified by education, training, licensure, regulation when applicable. So where does that leave us at this point? When we look at that term, qualified healthcare professional, qualified by education, training, licensure, regulation, what does that really mean? Does that mean an RN clinical staff who's working for Dr. Miller in the office or the diabetes educator? That, that, for instance, that would be me, Mary Ann. We really don't know. Medicare has, as right now, with all of their rules, has not given us specific guidance. So what I'm encouraging you to do is contact your state-specific Medicare administrative contractor, otherwise known as your MAC, and that's your state-specific insurance company who is under contract with CMS to process all the claims coming through this specific region, contact your MAC and ask them if your clinical staff can furnish these activities, then allowing the physician to bill. And to identify your MAC's name, phone number, and address for your multi-state region, you can go again to the CMS website access this URL and it'll take you right to the page to identify your MAC and contact information. Now, future revisions to code 99091. Some of you have heard me speak before on reimbursement. I always say that the reimbursement rules are all about the C's. 
They can be copious and challenging um, and CC, they're constantly changing. And that's true now for code 99091. Medicare has made two statements regarding future revisions of this benefit and the procedure code 99091. And just to verify that, to give you quote documentation on that, one of the statements they made, I'm gonna read this to you, is that the code in question, that's 99091, may not optimally describe these services as currently furnished. In order to reconcile these concerns, especially considering the expectation that CPT code revisions are expected in the immediate future. So this statement was made in 2018. Let's look at the next statement CMS made. Quote, we look forward to forthcoming coding changes through the CPT process that we anticipate will better describe the role of remote patient monitoring in contemporary practice and potentially mitigate the need for the additional billing requirements associated with these services. So the three key words there are forthcoming coding changes. So let's look at now remote patient monitoring in Medicare's quality payment program. Some of you may not be familiar with the QPP, but this is Medicare's first attempt or first entree into pay for performance value-based care reimbursement. So there are two different types of payment systems, incentive payment systems, bonus payment systems in the QPP. The one we're talking about today is the merit-based incentive payment system, otherwise known as MIPS. You know, we all love our acronyms, right? And it's one of two incentive or bonus payment systems under Medicare's big umbrella quality payment program. So this MIPS is for Medicare Part B providers who are eligible for payment incentives by earning a threshold number of what they call bonus points in a specific time period, it could be 90 days, for performing and reporting to CMS predefined what we call quality measures in four performance categories. And those quality measures run the gamut on medical interventions. So what are those four performance categories? They're quality, advancing care information, improvement activities, and that's the third one is what we're gonna focus on, and cost, which is defined as resource use. So for the physician, the eligible clinician, and there's only certain clinicians who are eligible to um, get bonus payments under MIPS, to earn these full bonus points and get that incentive bonus payment in the IA, Improvement Activity category, the provider must submit one of the following combinations of activities. And each of these activities must be performed for greater than or equal to 90 days during the calendar year 2018. Remember, Medicare is always going to constantly change the rules as we move forward. And so in MIPS, I already see proposed rule changes coming through on my CMS listservs. But these, what they have to do to earn the bonus points is accomplish or furnish two high-weighted activities or one high-weighted activity and two medium-weighted activities or four or more medium weighted activities. So I have good news for you on the next slide. Remote patient monitoring is in the Medicare QPP. It's one of the quality measures in the improvement activity category. And the good news, it's considered a high weighted activity. And that's the highest it gets. And the actual name of the activity in the IA category is in dark font there, engage patients and families to guide improvement in the systems of care. So specifically how they define this is engage patients and families by leveraging digital tools. Here we go, digital tools for ongoing guidance and assessments outside the encounter. What does that mean? The patient does not have to be in Dr. Miller's office of clinically valid 
objective and subjective data. Clinically valid, as we said, data is evidence-based. You can't get more clinically valid than that. The requirement for this performance activity, the requirements, I'm sorry, are identical to the reimbursement requirements from CMS for code 99091. Specifically, and importantly, the platform or the device for this digital remote patient monitoring has to collect patient-generated health data in an active feedback loop, meaning it has to be bi-directional, coming from cellular phones or web-enabled bi-directional or two-way systems, meaning a tablet, a computer, or a smartphone. The device has to provide patient-generated health data, again, in real-time or near-real-time, or generate that real-time or near-real-time automated feedback to the patient. So who are the MIPS Medicare Incentive Payment System eligible clinicians in the Medicare Quality Payment Program? who can then do this remote patient monitoring, and it's considered a high-weighted improvement activity. Physicians, physician assistants, nurse practitioners, clinical nurse specialists, and certified registered nurse anesthetists. Now let's look at the CMS proposed keyword proposed changes to RPM codes, because we just quoted you two quotes from CMS that indicated they will make changes to 99091 in the immediate future. So let's look at what they are proposing. They are, this is CMS now. CMS is proposing um, three, now three different RPM codes for 2019. Now we don't know yet when these three new codes will be implemented, meaning when they will be effective for use. So let's look at what they're proposing right now. 990XO, and X is called a placeholder. A number will be dropped in there when these codes are made effective. This is, these three are brand new codes they are proposing, but they do provide additional and needed uh, detailed guidance on how to use remote patient monitoring so there's no, there's less questions and we don't have to scratch our heads. So this first one is remote monitoring of physiological parameters and glucose monitoring is included in there, included in there, initial, setup and patient education on use of the equipment. Now this is important because this is a specific code just to train or educate the patient on the use of the equipment. Right now in 2018, there's only one code, 99091, and that includes the patient education. So they've separated out the patient education and has given it its own specific code, and it will have a reimbursement value when it becomes effective. Let's look at the next one, 990X1. Remote monitoring of physiological parameters, and again, that includes glucose monitoring, initial, device supply with daily recordings or programs, programmed alert transmission each 30 days. So this is payment to the provider for getting the platform software, purchasing that platform software in the computer in his or her office. So again, they've pulled out that part of that practice expense for the provider and has given it its own procedure code, which will have its own reimbursement rate. So this code is considered payment for a practice expense to the provider's office. The third code proposed, remote physiological monitoring treatment management services, 20 minutes or more of clinical staff, physician, other qualified healthcare professional time, in a calendar month requiring interactive communication with the patient caregiver, and that could mean not just the patient, but you're on the phone with the patient's home health care nurse or mother or father during the month. Now, what is significant here, and I'm very excited about this, what they're proposing, instead of a 30-minute threshold of time for the provider to bill in a 30-day period, they have decreased that to a 20-minute 
threshold of time. The other significant proposal here is that clinical staff, now they're saying clearly in writing, and there's no need then when this becomes effective to call your MAC, because now this new proposed code does say clinical staff. So clinic and keyword clinical. So an RN, a diabetes educator, when these codes become effective, and we don't know when that is, can now furnish these remote patient monitoring activities because they are clinical staff working for Dr. Miller, then allowing Dr. Miller or the nurse practitioner or the physician assistant to bill for this code. So it's, we've gone from 30 minutes to 20 minutes, and we've clearly now, with no ifs, ands, or buts, added clinical staff to furnish these activities. So again, just to emphasize, the new proposed codes, and there's three of them, and they're more specific now, they give us more guidance, where we require less time. We've gone now to 20 minutes instead of 30 minutes. Secondly, they offer separate and distinct payment for the initial setup and patient education and for the practice expense of the provider purchasing the software and loading that up into his computer and training his clinical staff. Because right now, code 99091 bundles the patient, active, the patient education and that practice expense of the software as part of the 30-minute requirement. And thirdly, the new proposed codes expressly, without a shadow of a doubt, allow clinical staff to perform the remote patient monitoring activities, not bill, but perform. See, code 99091, what we have right now, which is effective, does not expressly state in the definition of the code or in the federal register explanation whether clinical staff are able to perform these services. And that's why I encouraged you a few minutes ago, if you're using code 99091 right now, because it is effective, to contact your own MAC, your administrator, Medicare administrative contractor and specifically ask the MAC because they can make local coverage decisions and interpret codes if clinical staff is allowed to furnish now under code 99091. But when the new codes are effective, yes, the clinical staff can furnish. And I'm going to turn it over to Jenny. Thanks, Marianne. So I'm going to talk about how to implement glucose so that you can start remotely monitoring your patients with diabetes. So first, if you're a glucose user, um, the first thing that you need to do is confirm that your account has the remote monitoring features activated. If you're not sure, if you don't, or if you don't have a glucose account, that's no problem. Just send us an email at rpm at glucose.com and we can help you. Next, you should train providers on the requirements for 99091 um, and how to use Glucose for remote patient monitoring. Then outreach to your eligible Medicare patients with diabetes and let them know that remote patient monitoring is a service that you now provide. Uh, collect written patient consent to provide these services and document that in the patient's electronic medical record. Teach your patients on how to obtain and to use Google so that they can sync their device data and share that data with you. Provide and document these remote patient monitoring activities that accrue to 30 minutes per patient per 30 days. Then bill Medicare using the 99091 code. And then finally, receive reimbursement. And as we've talked about um, several times, the national unadjusted rate is a $58.68 per patient per 30 days. So for more information or if you have any other questions, feel free to email us at rpm at .com. And uh, thank you for your attention. We're going to now uh, open it up for questions and answers. And as a reminder, if you do have a question, please type it into the questions box on the GoToWebinar panel, and we will try to get to them.
So um, we do have some questions coming in. So I'm going to um, read them out and address them. So the first question we have is, um, if changes are coming in 2019 to these new additional codes that Medicare is proposing, why should we do, why should we use 99091 now? Shouldn't we wait until they finalize the codes next year? Okay, I'm going to take that question, Jenny, if you don't mind. Hi, everybody. Thanks for that question. Well, I've two two answers to that question. First of all, 99091 is available right now for reimbursement. Uh, and so, you're, and the second answer is that you're probably already doing these remote patient monitoring activities in your office. You're already reviewing patient data in your EMR. You're calling the patient on the phone, texting or emailing the patient, it's probably phone calls, to update the patient on care plan changes or have a conversation with the patient on the lifestyle elements leading to that change data. So if you're doing these activities anyway and you're not getting paid for it, this is an opportunity right now in 2018 to be paid for it. And that's really good news. We don't want to do services uh, basically for free. And Medicare is, is handing this to us. And it also allows you to kind of dip your toe into this kind of intervention, get used to remote patient monitoring, get paid for it, so that when the new codes come out, which are much more specific, um, you have this a greater familiarity now with the platform and, and what you need to do. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is, um, can you talk a little bit about uh, reimbursement through Medicare versus commercial insurance and Medicaid for remote patient monitoring? You know, that's another great question. And, you know, I applaud the person who asked that. Um, right now, we don't know if your state Medicaid programs, I don't know that, if your state Medicaid program is going, is paying for this right now, because there's 50 different Medicaid programs representing 50 states. And so it's just, it would be impossible to keep up with that for someone like me. So I encourage you to contact your, your Medicaid office and actually ask them about remote patient monitoring code 99091. You want to specifically talk about CPT code 99091 rather than asking about remote patient monitoring. Always use the CPT code or the HIPPICS code when you ask that question because that's how they'll reference it in their database. Now with private insurance companies, um, again, there's hundreds of them across the country and I really don't know which ones are paying for 99091 and which ones are not. My my best guess as an endocrinology coder, and I've been doing this a long time, is that several insurance, private insurance companies are paying for it. And the reason I say that as a guesstimate is because when private insurers um, try to determine whether they're going to cover an intervention, the first thing they do is look to Medicare. I, I can tell you that as a fact. They look to Medicare to see if Medicare is paying for the intervention because they know that Medicare spends a lot of time, money, and resources to um, implement research studies on an intervention to see if the intervention is cost-effective. And if it is, that's how Medicare decides to pay for it, along with other factors. So it just makes sense that the private insurer will say, gee, if Medicare is paying for it, it's been proven to be cost-effective. And you know, probably we should pay for it too. So with that said, Again, you would have to contact the private plan, the private insurer, and ask them about CPT code 99091. And then if they say they cover it, ask them what their coverage requirements are, uh, AKA reimbursement rules, because the private payer does not have to mimic the Medicare reimbursement rules. They have to follow the statutory language of the code, how the code is defined, because that's part of that will always be part of the reimbursement rules, but the private payer can implement different additional reimbursement rules that have to be identified by the provider and adhered to by the provider. The next question uh, we've gotten this question several times 
is uh, will there be a copay associated with 99091? Uh, there is a copay. There is a patient copay for 99091. Uh, Medicare, as many of you know, for many of their medical interventions, it's an 80 20 split where Medicare pays 80% of the adjusted, geographically adjusted payment rate. And the beneficiary is responsible for 20% of the geographically adjusted payment rate. Um, for other interventions, the copayment, the beneficiary copayment has been waived. There's several interventions like that, including medical nutrition therapy. But for this particular benefit, the patient copay has not yet been waived. Uh, the next question, um, we have several questions around which codes can 99091 be billed alongside with? So the first one is, can it be billed along with the chronic care management code in the same month? The answer is yes, and this is really good news. I was very pleased to uh, read this and hear this, is that yes, 99091 remote patient monitoring services for, can be billed on the same day for the same patient as chronic care management, transition care management, and even behavioral health integration, and an evaluation and management or E&M visit by the provider, or even a procedure that occurs in the provider's office. Um, so yes, both can be billed certain benefits like chronic care management, transition care management, behavioral health integration, an evaluation and management visit with the provider, and other procedural activities can be billed on the same day for the same beneficiary as CPT code 99091. Great, and then the follow-on question to that is can 99091 be billed alongside with CPT 95251, which is the CGM data interpretation code? The, again, the answer is yes. Yes, 99091 can be billed on the same day for the same beneficiary as CGM interpretation. Great. Uh, Any the other? Next question, the next question is around uh, monitoring um, the time spent to meet the 30 minute requirement. How will CMS monitor the time spent? Will time stamping in the elect electronic record be monitored? Um, see, Medic, your MAC, your, you know, your claim is going to your Medicare administrative contractor. And when that claim is electronically sent, the claim goes through what I call various filters. And each filter, each layer is looking for a specific piece of data on the claim. Um, to see if the data was entered correctly. So remember, your MAC is just looking at that electronic claim. And on that very first claim, there is no documentation attached to the initial claim. So the answer to your question is no, your MAC, your Medicare Administrative Contractor, getting that electronic claim, they're not into your EHR. And so they're not monitoring that the, the start time and the end time and to see if you've met the 30 minute threshold, um, they don't have that ability to do that. The, the overarching ethical billing rules from the offer, Office of the Inspector General, is like this ethical governing body over CMS, um, they have published ethical billing rules. And one of the ethics says that providers um, are responsible for adhering to all of the very specific reimbursement rules that occur or should occur right in the brick and mortar practice setting. And some of you have heard me say this before, that when you look at all the reimbursement rules for any Medicare benefit, about 80% of them, this is my opinion, about 80% of them are not reflected on the claim form, but they have to be adhered to at the brick and mortar setting. And of course, Medicare won't know if you're adhering to them at the brick and mortar facility. So what Medicare does then is they do audits. They do whistleblower audits or random audits, um, and they physically come into the brick and mortar 
And that's where they can check right there if the bulk of those rules, like did you record the start and end time? Did you meet the 30 minute threshold? Did you get the written consent from the beneficiary for RPM services? Uh, that's where they're gonna know if you've, if you've met those thresholds and if you did the other requirements right in the brick and mortar facility. Okay, the next question is around the clinical staff. So if the clinical staff works for a facility and not for a physician, would the clinical staff allow it to be used the time spent on remote patient monitoring to bill? My understanding uh, is yes, but re remember right now, um, clinical staff is not specifically defined right now in 2018 with code 99091. When you look at the definition of the code, which is part of the reimbursement rules, the definition of the code is part of the reimbursement rules, and it doesn't specifically say clinical staff. And so that's why I'm encouraging you to contact your own Medicare administrative contractor right now in 2018 and ask that question. You know, if that was just an inadvertent omission by Medicare when they rolled out this benefit in 2018. Um, and so if, if, if they say yes, clinical staff can furnish, and that's a MAC decision, not ours, then yes, because 99091 is payable in a facility, which means hospital, then the answer would be yes. But again, that's a MAC guidance and a MAC decision right now in 2018. But just as a reminder, when the new proposed RPM codes are implemented, and we don't know, we're, we're hoping it'll be in 2019, but we don't have an effective date, uh, we have three new codes, one for education, one for the practice expense of getting the software, and then one for the 20-minute the threshold. And those new codes specifically say that clinical staff can furnish. So that's the good news. Great. Uh, the next question is, um, does the current code require the 30 minutes of time to be spent directly speaking with the patient or does reviewing the data count towards that 30 minute threshold? Oh, that the reviewing of the data does count, absolutely. And that's part of that definition of quote, remote. Because the patient could be sitting in a restaurant eating dinner and Dr. Miller is looking at the blood glucose data in his office on the gluco application on the computer and the patient could be 10 miles away eating dinner in a restaurant. So when Dr. Miller is reviewing that blood glucose data, those minutes he's spending, he or she is spending, is, is going into that 30 minute threshold. Absolutely, without the patient physically being there. And let's say Dr. Miller then picks up the phone and calls the patient on the phone. And the patient is in the restaurant, picks up his cell phone, and Dr. Miller says, you know, you're, you're going too many hypos. We want you to, uh, oh, you're on four diabetes medications. We want you to not take this one in particular. And that phone call, however many minutes Dr. Miller is spending on the phone, those minutes are also then to be documented by Dr. Miller that goes into that 30 minute threshold. Okay, great. Uh, we have time for one more question. So again, if we didn't get to your question, we are sending out a survey after the call. So please feel free to uh, put in any questions that we didn't get to and we'll be sure to get back to you by email. Uh, but this last question, I'm, I'm going to paraphrase. Um, and I believe what the question is, uh, is when you're doing remote patient monitoring, um, does it have to be just for diabetes or can you also remotely monitor other conditions like uh, heart conditions, um, weight loss, et cetera? Uh, yes, you can. Other conditions fall into, right now in 2018 with code 99091, it, it, it does include other conditions and other monitoring of other physiological data in addition to blood glucose monitoring. And that's because we know that because of the definition of CPT code 99091. 
it says about physiological data, and then it has the parentheses, and you can, you can just Google 99091, and you'll see the definition. You can do that immediately. And it says parentheses, ECG, blood pressure. Okay, so right there, ECG, blood pressure. And I think there's a few other terms after that. So the answer is yes, other data besides blood glucose data. And then Medicare has not said that the beneficiary has to have a specific diagnosis in order for this to occur and to be billed. They, they did not say the patient has to have diabetes or uh, hyperlipidemia or hypertension. Um, so, you know, the diagnosis has to go on the claim, but Medicare does not say it has to be a specific diagnosis. Great. Thank you, Marianne, so much for all of this information, and thank you for everyone who joined the webinar. Uh, like I said at the top of the webinar, we are recording this session, so this recording will be available very shortly. We'll be sending this out by email to everyone who registered um, for the webinar, so, so keep an eye out for it in your inbox. And thank you again for your time. Have a great day. Bye, everybody.